this point. And that's been very clear in all the communication. So one of the, the other issues that we have faced is the issue of equity um, and equity in many different ways. One of course was just simply technology access. So we've done, even since our last meeting, we've done another um, distribution of computers. This time we had a little over 500, 550 computers that we distributed. This time, because there were so many, we had them at every single school. The week prior to that, we had about 400. So altogether, uh, the district has distributed uh, over a thousand of our Chromebooks uh, for students in grades one through 12. And we continue to get some uh, requests about that. And um, those are basically being handled at the school level at this point. Another issue of equity is just time equity. Um, it's not always possible for students to be at a, uh, be able to come into a Google Hangout or a chat um, at a specific time during the day because of um, issues. Their parents may be on a maybe working at home, or there may be more than one child using a computer, um, or they may be taking care of their little their brothers and sisters. So um, a parent can work. So there's a lot of issues, and there's more than that of things I've heard that present equity issues for having uh, a, having assignments be synchronous to a specific time. So everything that we're doing, other than when we schedule a chats or there's um, scheduled office hours, that has been asynchronous, meaning that the the Students can go to Google Classroom at any time in the day and do um, and to communicate with their teacher to learn what the assignments are and do them at different times during the day. And that is going to be true through this entire period that we that we are in up to May 4th. Um, so there so those were the key issues. One of the, the report the entire report that we had to consolidate as much of the information as we could about uh, remote learning um, has been sent to all parents, is on the website. Um, key, key ideas in that have been linked back to the FAQ that's on our website. We continuously update the enrichment website as well as information about how to access uh, technology, uh, how Parents can help their student log in. So there's just a, a continuous um, effort to stay current and provide as much information as possible. Now, since um, the announcement by the governor, one of the, uh, I think one of the areas where there's just been um, a lot of information that has just been recently um, uh, given to districts from the Department of Education in Massachusetts, as well as the U.S. Department of Education, is what um, what we will do about students with special um, needs as we move forward. While we have these assignments, the things we've been working on over the last couple of weeks is making sure that to this to the extent possible. Um, our classroom teachers collaborate with our special education teachers in order to provide uh, accommodations that accompany the assignment. And uh, I think if you go to the enrichment page, you'll see that there are a lot of those um, that are linked to assignments. So um, I want to just ask Allison Elmer, who is our director of special education, if she would update the committee on what are some of the key uh, guidelines that we have received in the last couple of weeks. Hi, thank you. So yes, Dr. Bodie, um, as you noted, uh, around March 25th, the um, US federal government issued uh, new guidance regarding the provision of special ed services during school closure, um, which acknowledges uh, the need to provide a FAPE or free and appropriate public education, which is explicitly tied to the IEP. Um, we then had to await guidance from the Mass DESE um, to interpret that for what that meant for Massachusetts, um, which came out the following week. Uh, so during that time, we've been providing um, two levels of service, that which is um, resources and support, which you just described. Um, 
Dr. McNeil, uh, he and his team created the enrichment um, page within days of the school, um, the district going into closure. Um, and then our special education team then looked at what was up there and created additional resources, as you described, to help make those enrichment activities accessible to um, the students that they serve. In addition to that, they, reach, they have been reaching out individually to families um, as educational teams, checking in on how the assignments are going, providing individualized schedules, providing individualized um, learning activities. Um, if the student you know, is working on a separate curricula from their grade level, as well as um, providing the types of general accommodations you mentioned um, or other learning supports. Um, going into this next phase, um, the other piece of service delivery that uh, as part of providing a FAPE is the instruction and services. So I was just on a conference call today with the uh, associate, senior associate commissioner, uh, Russell Johnston, uh, and he's essentially the director of special ed for the entire state. And they issued uh, what they're called a, a template for individual student service plans. However, we uh, created those last week and essentially um, we have about 900 in district IEP. So um, if you can understand the scope of what our special educators have been asked to do in the last week is to take every student IEP and now create an individual service plan. Um, so over the course of the year, we typically, you know, have 900 IEP meetings in, within this week. Um, teams have been working to create individual plans for each student. Um, unfortunately, due to the holiday tomorrow, they're most likely go out on Monday. Um, some may go out. Can I interrupt just one second? Yeah. I'm sorry, um, Selmer. I, I just got a text that people are having a hard time hearing you. You're not muted. I know that. So can maybe you not just bring it a little bit closer. I'm sorry. Uh, I, mean, your thought. I have a microphone right here. Is it okay. still not working? Um, I don't know. Sounds fine to fine. me. Okay. Um, okay, I thank hear, you. I hear you fine. I hear you All fine. All right, thank you. Um, and so uh, those plans uh, will be directed to each individual family. Um, if not tomorrow, then um, the beginning of next week in which they will outline the individual services that um, providers will be um, giving to students. That includes things like remote occupational therapy to the extent, as you mentioned, to the extent that we are able to provide services remotely. Obviously, there are some services that the federal state government recognized cannot be delivered remotely. Um, but to the extent that uh, we can provide those services through remote format, we will. And that takes a similar um, uh, constellation of services that may be recorded lessons. It may still be work packets. It can be live sessions. Um, acknowledging as you have the limitations that we have for some families around being able to, um, you know, log on a specific time. Um, so all of that will be uh, going forward. And then uh, we've had some security issues that we have to address um, as far as having remote uh, IEP meetings. Um, so we are working with our provider, Easy IEP, so that we are able to send um, you know, documented that, that are password protected and encrypted so that we can hold online IEP meetings. Um, we've met with Easy IEP twice this week uh, to get that up and running. And as soon as they're able to release that to us, uh, we will then start scheduling IEP meetings um, to uh, require that I've mentioned in our letter um, that are required. So unfortunately, there are a number of times that a team may be requested to reconvene, whether there's rejections in the IEP or not. Given our limitations and the ability to schedule um, both meetings that have already passed and meetings that are upcoming, um, we will be prioritizing those with required timelines. So families should expect to receive um, invitations um, to schedule those meetings over the course of next week and the following week. Um, would you like questions at this point before we go on or just keep going? Are you asking me or the committee? I'm asking Mr. <laughs> Garden. Yeah. Oh, uh, if, if we're done with um, the special education update, why don't we do a round of questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Hainer, do you have any My questions? My only question on is I just, just for clarification. It's my. Did I understand you correctly that it it 
what you're trying to do and it's your intent to do it is to deliver the IEP as best you can remotely. And you yeah. will be doing, uh, and part of that will be an uh, assessment and determining uh, the success uh, and progress of the child. Is that correct? So what will happen is the teams have been working together this week to determine what are the level of services that are necessary to maintain existing skills and prevent significant regression. Um, you know, similar to uh, Commissioner Riley's letter, this is not going to replicate the full IEP, just like this is not going to replicate the full school day. Um, so teams are doing that. We are providing notice to the family of those services. This is, this is not an amendment to the IEP. This is not a change to the IEP, so it does not require consent. Um, however, families can opt out given some of the constraints that Dr. Bodie had mentioned. Um, and so that going forward, they will continue to receive the services um, that, you know, the team has determined to uh, prevent, maintain uh, existing skills and prevent substantial regression if over the course of this period and if it goes longer than May 4th um, and, you know, the team sees that it's not enough or that, you know, they can reconsider and um, redevelop that individual plan. So I think you've answered me. I just want to verify it. There will be a two-way communication. Programs will be offered to, to the child the child will be doing some sort of work or some sort of uh, to show that the, he or she is is uh, attempting to work on that skill or whatever it is done. There'll be assessment done by the uh, provider and moving on for either evaluating it and going forward. Am I correct? Sure. I, I think probably um, I need to I know what definition you're using for assessment. I, it's not going to be a formal battery of assessment. It's going to be the judgment, the professional judgment of the individual as they are interacting uh, but, with the student through the various formats to determine right. if that's sufficient. I, and with I, feedback, I, yeah. I, I recognize that, but there will be a record kept of what has been offered and yes. the child's progress and uh, what's going on. I'm not... I, I understand the restrictions. I think this is wonderful. Thank you very much for you. And please pass on my personal uh, appreciation to your staff. Thank you. And I will. Great. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? You're, you're muted if you're talking. All right. <laughs> We'll come back to her. Uh, uh, Ms. Seuss, you were able to join us. Thank you for joining. Uh, did you have any questions or comments? All right, uh, uh, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, just one question, I guess maybe for Kathy and for um, uh, Allison. The, uh, you know, there's a narrative out there that says that we're not able to advance the curriculum for our students uh, because uh, 15% or 900 of our students or so on IEPs. And um, I think actually what we've, I've learned in these, in these this, this, this meeting and in other discussions is that we're not able to advance the curriculum for all students because it's, it's challenging to replicate uh, the school day given the fact that children are in their homes and they're living in different circumstances all day long. So, I mean, how would you respond to people who say, Maybe this should be for Dr. Bodhi. Uh, I have an answer. That, <laughs> oh, you have an answer too, Allison. Okay, maybe. I'm sorry. Then I didn't mean to. I didn't no. mean to you. Um, you know, how would you respond to people say we can't advance the curriculum because 15% of our kids are on IEPs and we can't accommodate them all? I, I yield to Dr. Bodhi, but. <laughs> okay, I, I, I mean, you, you, whoever should answer it. <laughs> um, well, the question is really, what does advancing the curriculum mean? Um, yeah. There is a lot that can be done in broadening it, deepening it. Um, this is something that we are wrestling with right now. Um, this particular plan that we have, it's very clear when I put it out, is from April 6th to May 4th. But we do have to, if, if for some reason we get an announcement in the next week or so that um, schools are going to be closed for more, more time, perhaps even for the rest of the year, we have had, been having a lot of discussions in the district in terms of how we're gonna plan for that. Um, and I think at the next school committee meeting that we have, it'll be a good time to get report out on that. 
but it's not even just equity in terms of accommodations. It's um, if, if there is no way to replicate a school day. And if we were to go on in a curriculum, it would be probably more uh, not synchronous, not in the moment um, lessons, but rather um, some kind of video or um, readings or whatever. And there are students that are going to have difficulty with this. It's not just um, special education. It's, it's our English language learners as well um, that need a lot of one-on-one -on -one in order to be able to do to do the work. Um, so it's, I wouldn't just say that it's our students that have, um, uh, dip, you know, learning uh, or have individual education plans, but it's our English language learners. And it's also the students that um, are in our, in our homes that have different, as you mentioned, different situations that make it very difficult uh, for them to, to access the information. I'll give you one example. And uh, we just, we, uh, to a family that we had given a computer, uh, for some reason, they're now not able to have internet access. So there are also technology issues for a lot of our students. I will say this, that no matter what we do, May 4th beyond, we all in the district recognize that we're going to have to do remediation next year. Uh, that is, and we're going to be planning for that um, in, in every one of our grade levels, every course, we, we have to plan for that next year. So that, that would be part of any plan that we have and in, in order to maintain equity for all students. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Schickman, you're up next. Thank you. I was just uh, wanted to get a very brief sense of how things are going for our out of district placements. So our out of district uh, placements, so we have, you know, essentially three types of out of district placements. We have public day placements, which are otherwise known as collaboratives. Uh, we have private day placements, and then we have residential schools. Um, most of the Commonwealth's residential schools have remained open with the exception of a very small handful. Um, so in, by and large, most of those students are, you know, in their residence. There are some um, cases where either uh, a, a parent obviously could elect or a guardian could elect it to bring the student home from the residence and in many of the uh, residential schools have a policy where they're not allowed to return during the um, closure simply because they want to, you know, prevent the spread of any possible, um, you know, COVID infection. Um, so there are a few instances uh, where we have had students who are now home by the choice of their families um, to, uh, rather than to stay in the residence. Uh, the private day schools and collaboratives are responsible for the same plans that we just described to you. They're responsible for a remote learning plan, um, similar to what Dr. Bodie has described, and then they're responsible for the delivery of special ed services, um, those individual uh, service plans that I've mentioned. Uh, they, we are continuing to pay full tuition to these placements, um, so the expectation is that they are providing those services. Great, thank you. Thank you. Good, uh, Ms. Morgan. So just to clarify, we're just doing questions about special education right now, yes? Yes. Okay, um, so I had two. Um, the first one is probably, so um, for the IEP meetings, I've gotten a lot of questions about that from families. Has that, you know, the information about, it sounds like you're making good progress um, with the software and that seems like a really real problem. I think anybody can understand that. Has that been communicated to families and sort of secondarily to that piece, um, what is the plan for students who are awaiting placement decisions for next year for whom the assessments haven't been, were not completed before we left school? So that's one question. So one communication to parents about where we're at with scheduling those IEP meetings and then what the plan is for kids whose uh, assessments weren't done. And then the other piece is, and I think this is, it's actually probably not a question, it's just feedback. You know, it's hard for me to reconcile as a school committee member, what I hear here, which sounds, you know, fairly, you know, like we're making progress and things are being done. And then what I hear from parents, which is, you know, my child receives 40 minutes of reading instruction 
daily when she's in school and she's had one 10 minute meeting with a reading instructor since we got out of school four weeks ago. And I, like, I just can't, I can't rec, I get we're not trying to replicate school, but I feel like we are so far apart right now. Um, and so it's, it's hard. It's, I think, you know, I do think a lot of our families have been really patient with us. And um, so it's tough. It's tough to hear what, what it's, you know, what's being said that's being done and then hear the stories about what people's experiences are and, and just seems like we're really, you know, we're really far apart. So um, that's my feet. That's my feedback, but I would like um, to understand, you know, what we're telling parents about these IEP meetings, and then what we're going to do for kids who have not received, ha didn't have their assessments done before we left school. So as far as communication, um, the special ed webpage has, um, is updated uh, with that information. Um, as far as we are going to be planning the IEP meetings, um, and that they're coming out, and then Dr. Bodie um, sent a all um, community uh, email last week indicating that we will be moving forward with scheduling meetings. Um, it did not describe our the ins and outs of EZIEP, however, told they could to um, have the school reach out to them to start scheduling meetings shortly. Um, your question about if a student required an assessment, if you're referring to a reevaluation or an initial evaluation that was not completed prior to the closure, um, in most cases, by and large, um, those types of assessments require face-to-face -face interaction. You can't deliver, you know, you can't do a whisk uh, over online. So those timelines are effectively stopped right now. Um, I don't know if that's the question you're asking regarding a change in placement, um, because that may not be, um, if you're referring to um, someone who has requested a change in placement or if they're transitioning grades, I think that would be a different um, question so no I'm just I'm mostly asking you know oftentimes there are various assessments and evaluations that right. theoretically have to be done before mm -hmm. you have an IEP meeting right so people who maybe have their IEP meetings scheduled for May the expectation was is that right. you know whatever these evals were were being done in April or maybe late right. March and for those students that didn't happen so those timelines are paused so, so those timelines, we will not be able to resume those until we return to um, the end of this closure because they require face-to-face -face, um, interaction in order to complete those assessments. And then, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember. I, I know you made a comment around. Um, yeah, those were my two questions. mentioned reading. Um, I, I do want to offer, and I don't know if this parent was specifically speaking to a reading service that's in their IEP or if they're talking about the tiered instruction that many of our students receive. So I, I couldn't speak to someone's experience about receiving one 10 minute session, so to speak. But as I mentioned, up until last week, the um, Department of Education had not indicated what direct services were going to be. Um, so all teachers should have been reaching out, offering activities and assessment. Even if we move forward with services, it's not going to replicate a five time a week, 40 minute session per day. So I just want to be clear that similar to Commissioner Riley's um, guidance, you know, we are having this halving, cutting in half the school day essentially. And that is still a combination of um, activities. It's not just sitting in front of a computer screen for three hours. So special ed services are not going to look exactly like they looked um, prior. That's a, a good point that was going to, my next notes on this is that there, there are guidelines from the state with respect to how much time students should spend in learning activities. The, that guideline of three hours is, is encompassing, uh, it's, it's an encompassing uh, three hours of exercise or mindfulness or other learning activities, sometimes, sometimes self-directed in terms of interest. It is not sitting in front of a computer working on, on, ex, on assignments on the computer. And, and that's really important. Remote learning is not the same thing as online learning. And I think we're all we're all evolving in this and trying very hard to um, be as responsive as possible and as robust in what we can offer as possible. But uh, it is not uh, that's really important. We're not giving assignments where kids are going to sit in front of their computer for three hours. It's just that's not how it's 
designed to work or, or being recommended. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Allison Yampi, did you, we skipped over you before. Did you have anything to add? Yeah, sorry. Um, my questions have been answered at this point. I just wanted to mention that my computer is just hanging on by its fingernails right now. So okay. I've turned off, I'm here. I had to turn off video, but I'm listening. And if I leave, I'll come back. Okay. That's all. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I guess my question, mm -hmm. my questions, um, so, uh, just to clarify, I think, I think there, there's a lot of anxiety about the transitions, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Elmer, so if somebody who is at the preschool going to kindergarten or at fifth grade going to, to Gibbs or at Gibbs going to Audison or at Audison going to the high school, and those meetings would be happening, in, you know, now. Mm -hmm. uh, starting now, and they're not going to happen. So how are we going to handle those, assuming we don't reopen, uh, and I, maybe you haven't gotten there yet, but, but how are we going to handle those transitions, and how are we going to let people know that we're, how we're going to handle those transitions? So I think it's important to note that so in some cases, transition meetings have been happening throughout the year. So, you know, even in November, if a fifth grader is having their annual review, we will oftentimes invite a member from the Gibbs, um, you know, sixth grade school to that meeting. So that happens throughout the year. Um, we have already had our internal meetings prior to the break, uh, closure, I should say, sorry, um, prior to the closure about the transitions um, from fifth to sixth grade. And um, I know, and uh, Ms. Keyes can speak to some of the work that they're doing over um, at the Audison about the transition from Gibbs to Audison. Um, so I think one, there are fewer meetings possibly that need to happen than maybe people assume. Not every fifth grader who has an IEP who is transitioning um, to Gibbs needs them. Um, if it is required, as I mentioned, we are um, prioritizing required team meetings. Um, those would require timelines. If an IEP has not been updated um, to reflect because their annual hadn't happened, then that meeting is going to be the transition meeting. Um, what I'm referring to are some of these optional meetings where folks um, wanted to have another meeting to, you know, discuss concerns that they had, we will have to figure out how to have something more informal than um, that. But if it's a required team meeting because their annual is coming up and they're a fifth grader or and they're an eighth grader going to ninth or and they're a preschooler, those meetings are still going to happen. Great, that's great. And, and that message will be going out shortly with so people will be reached out to individually. So that's a question that we received from um, some folks have been emailing Dr. Bodie or me, um, you know, wanting to know the specifics of the remote learning plans. As I mentioned before, each one is individual to the child. So there's 900 roughly individual remote service plans being developed over the course of this past week that are going out to families. Um, similarly, those individually scheduled meetings, the team chairperson will be reaching out directly to those families who have meetings with required timelines to schedule them. Once we get more information about May 4th and we move further in, obviously we'll have to um, address um, more meetings, um, but obviously our priority right now is for meetings that have already, you know, would have already occurred or are set to occur during, you know, the next few weeks up to May 4th. Okay, great, thank you. All right, Dr. Bodie, back to you. Um, thank you. Uh, I wanted to, to ask Dr. McNeil if he would talk a little bit about um, the work that's been that's going on in terms of the types of assignments and what we're doing. We, we have um, as you, in the remote plan that everybody has had a copy of, and I won't repeat everything that's in it by any means, but we, we have some differences among the schools, which is fine in terms of how assignments go out and and uh, whether there's a staggered rollout during a week or whether it's everything is loaded on a Monday. Uh, and those were individual school decisions with their, their staff. Um, but I think it would be helpful to hear a little bit about the, the actual sort of the, the focus of these assignments. And Dr. McNeil, would you like to speak to that? Sure, thank you. Hi to everybody. 
Um, so, you know, at the at the onset of of our school closure, we worked to provide consistency. Um, in order to do that, we looked at it from a district level. So, um, our curriculum leaders work with the coaches at the, in the various content areas, and then in the specialist areas, it was pretty much at the level of the curriculum leaders that were. Uh, looking at the various activities, the enrichment activities that would meet our goal for review and, you know, going deeper in, in, in a various um, concept. So we have pretty much like maintained that at this particular point in time. Um, and, uh, and I can speak to each content area in order to give you some specifics. Um, looking at um, uh, literacy, uh, the coaches are still and, and when I say that, the coaches are working with the teachers in order to you know, identify various activities. So um, looking at um, literacy, uh, the coaches have been working with the teachers and they've come up with the various um, activities that uh, teachers can choose from. Uh, so to, to maintain that foundation of consistency across the district, and then teachers can definitely supplement those foundational activities with things that, are, that they would like to add uh, and push out and post on their Google Classrooms. So that's pretty much um, what we've done for literacy and for math. So, you know, at, and then those assignments are shared with principals and teachers um, on it. So like, as we move into this period of time of having providing more structure, it will be on Tuesday. So next Tuesday, um, well, you know, depending on whether or not we're gonna be in school, but the way that it would work is that next Tuesday, on a Tuesday, the uh, principals and teachers will, will receive the information for the following week. So they, they will have the rest of that week in order to develop schedules that they can send out and post on their Google Classrooms uh, so that parents can you know, have a choice or students can have a choice. And then there can be recommended activities uh, that the um, students and, and parents can choose from. Now in social studies and science, it's been a little bit more prescriptive uh, and they've been actually giving specific lessons that um, students can follow on a weekly basis. So those will also be pushed out uh, to teachers and principals on the previous Tuesday. Uh, as it relates to the specials, um, they give a, a range of various activities, uh, K through five. Uh, for instance, in health and wellness, in health and wellness, there's a K-5 April calendar of various things that students can um, you know, do on each day in order to, make, to remain active. And then looking at the um, <clears throat> K through five uh, music, they have things for K through two and three through five. Again, a choice of activities that teachers can choose from that they can highlight on their um, classroom pages. And then um, looking at our library resources, we have a page of that, that, uh, and that has different links on it that can um, give parents access to the Robbins Library, also Boston Public Schools, I mean, excuse me, Boston Public Library, where um, they could, you know, do some remote um, checkout of uh, books. So we have uh, various things uh, that teachers can choose from. Same thing with art, for visual arts, it's like a, a bank of activities that um, parents and students can choose from. So that's pretty much the structure of how it's going to work as we move forward and that started on April 6th and we'll go forward to May 4th until we get more direction of how we're going to, whether or not we're gonna be in school uh, beyond that. At the secondary level that- Oh was, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, yes. Right, I, I can do we it have now. a slightly different way of doing it because we have yes. a lot of teaming that's going on. Right. Um, we have Ms. Keys here, to, she could maybe even wanna talk about that. Um, but there yeah. is a, a, a lot of collaboration that's going on, the mm -hmm. same, learning community and same discipline. Right, exactly. So that, that same concept is trying to be consistent, um, which is in, a little bit easier at the secondary level um, so where the teachers can work with the curriculum leaders and the, um, so they can push out specific assignments. And again, you know, at the secondary level, I would say that because they have a little bit more experience using Google Classroom. And so they pretty much use that throughout the year. So it was that learning curve that had to happen at the elementary level with the use of Google Classroom and Google Hangouts Meet uh, that really had to take place. So at the secondary level, it was a little bit more easier of a transition to do that because of their usage of Google Classroom that they've done, or that they already had that um, knowledge base. Um, 
I don't necessarily want to put Miss Keys on the spot, but I don't know if she would like to report a little bit about what experience of a, of a teacher has been in this. Sure, um, it's it's definitely been interesting. We're essentially writing entirely new curriculum as we go because when you say go back and reteach what you've already done, well, I've already taught that, so it's creating entirely new lessons. So I know my department, we meet twice a week, once to figure out what we want to do the following week. And then we all go on our own and sort of come up with something, divide up the labor and then meet back together again and share what we've come up with. And then from that pool of resources, we're able to craft stuff specifically for our students. So, you know, sometimes one teacher has covered a concept that I haven't covered yet. So I can't use that resource, but we're getting the same general pool of resources out for our students. Mm -hmm. At this point, we're looking at between a 40 and 50% participation rate from kids, as far as kids who are going into Google Classroom, opening up the assignments and doing them. It's not always the same 40 or 50%. Um, we've heard from almost every kid at this point. I caught my last one today. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's a lot of work trying to create entirely new lessons and then grade them without any real student interaction throughout the process. So it's it's sort of all the bad parts of the job. It's the lesson planning and the grading without the good parts, which is the kids. So it's it's been hard. It's been a lot of work. Well, we're not, we're not exactly grading. Uh, it, we're, no, we're, I'm sorry. It's, it's feedback. 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 So it's yeah. yeah, and it's, it's so much more time consuming to t try to like type out what a kid did wrong on something than to just point at, point at it and be like, see here, you missed this one. Yeah. So it's it's, it's good to be giving them that feedback, but it definitely takes a lot of time. And teachers have been reaching out to kids that are not participating. I think what we're seeing is that the secondary level, which you're reporting, it's, it's in the, it depends on the course and it depends on the level of the course. We're seeing the most participation at the lower grades. Uh, we're seeing a high participation in the 80, 90%. And as they go up, uh, it, it does vary and it does sometimes not the same students either. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I will emphasize the fact that, you know, to Ms. Elmer's point about collaboration amongst teachers and, uh, you know, special education uh, teachers and other support personnel, that there is that collaboration there. So that that happens before the assignments are pushed out onto Google Classroom. And then also there's various links that can be put on the teacher's Google Classroom site that teachers can, I mean, that students can access that can help with uh, a particular assignment like graphic organizers and other resources that are available to them, which are also available on the enrichment page. So uh, we've tried to do our best. Um, and I think we actually, we've done a very good job of providing those type of resources. And so, and also that with the communication that te that students can, can, um, utilize on the Google Classroom page with contacting their teacher, that, that's where that collaboration between student and teacher can take place as well. So I, I just want to applaud all of our teachers and coaches and specialists and everyone has really rallied uh, at this point in order to provide, I think, a very strong and robust foundation of activities um, that students can draw from. And I think at this point, it's just at the elementary level, um, is it's trying to make sure that we're providing that direction for students and parents so they can they can structure a, a weekly calendar and also at the secondary level making sure that that's still ongoing. We are um, teachers are reaching out to students who are not participating and so if, if I was to say anything tonight to parents who might be listening is that we really need your uh, partnership in this to have your students your child uh, participate in, in the, these learning activities. Um, your role is really essential in this process. I see Mr. McCarthy's on here. I don't know if he'd like to have a little update from the high school perspective. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Um, I just wanted to say, um, you know, you were, you were speaking about reaching out to students uh, that we haven't heard from, and I just wanted to applaud the school counselors, the guided, uh, the social workers and the deans, uh, in addition to the teachers, which have done an amazing job of reaching out to the students. Um, we have gotten contact with just about every single student just to check in, uh, make sure they're doing well beyond the academics, just to make sure that they're doing well in terms of um, having food at home, uh, that they feel safe, that they have internet connections and technology. And uh, I think that's that speaks to a huge amount of what the infrastructure that need to be put in place 
uh, that Dr. McNeil was talking about. And uh, he's done a wonderful job of, of leading us through this, giving us um, direction through the uh, curriculum leaders. Uh, so far, uh, we have been using the Google Classrooms that Dr. McNeil was talking about. We had those in place the last couple of years. So they've been working really well. Um, and it's a, a natural transition for the students. They're used to them and they've been accessing them. Uh, like Julie Key said, we've got about 40, 50% uh, on average participation from the students, which is, is great. And um, you know, we're hoping that will continue on and we'll see how May 4th rolls out. All right, is there any questions before we move on? Let's do a round uh, uh, based on all that, which is quite a bit. Uh, Mr. Hainard, you're first. Uh, Dr. McNeil, uh, you may have addressed this and I apologize if I missed it. Uh, I heard that there's communication back and forth at the secondary level. Is that going on uh, with the, at the elementary level as well? With the mean? students? You mean between uh, uh, staff? Teachers and, teachers yes. and students, yes. Yes. And uh, is part of that interaction, uh, from, I, I keep using the word assessment, uh, just evaluating what is going on, the programs that they're, that they're suggesting to their students? Or awesome. is it, is it a, a help or both? So I would say it's both. I mean, we try to balance, um, like Mr. McCarthy was saying about the social emotional piece of it. Uh, and just, I think, you know, to answer your first question, yes, teachers from the get go. And I, and, and this is where I think I really need to emphasize just the, the passion and the willingness of our teachers in order to reach out to students, because that has been happening from day one, since the first, you know, day that we were out. Uh, that was a big concern of teachers of being able to reach out and maintain that community aspect that they've developed uh, since the beginning of the year within their classroom. Mm -hmm. So they were doing it in a, in a, in a, a myriad of ways. I think uh, within the last week and, and since the first day, we've kind of come to an understanding of like, these are the different methods that we're going to utilize to maintain contact. And at the elementary level, that was the um, adding on, not adding on, but like really, um, delving into the use of the Google Classroom and the Google Hangouts Meet. So right now, you know, the expectation is that, you know, all staff will reach out at least two times a week um, to their uh, classrooms, the students in their classrooms. And I think that's been going on. And, 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 I, and I dare say that that's been going on even more than two times a week. So, um, you know, I just, I just can't say enough about the dedication and the passion of our all everybody has taken a team effort and so to answer your question yes that's been happening right. and what goes on in those in those meetings you know it's going to vary between you know depending on what the teacher wants to focus on but I, I think that you know most of our teachers are just concerned about maintaining that community aspect and so making those live interactions fun and engaging and not so much about academics but if they do discuss academics, I think it's done in a fun way. And um, so that they can, you know, make sure that the teach the students feel safe and that they're able to um, really connect with the teacher at that particular time. So uh, I think they've done that very well. And I, and I will say that I want us to continue to emphasize the social and emo emotional piece of this, because I think that's the one thing that really, you know, kids want to come on. And I've heard reports that kids just like seeing their classmates and just being able to interact and the teachers have been, you know, showing a little bit more of themselves. Like, you know, hey, this is my, you know, the, you know, taking, you know, sharing like, this is my pet, you know, so it really gives an opportunity for, um, for uh, teachers to do that. And I will say that uh, this week uh, that Gibbs, a video from Gibbs that the teachers did, the whole staff has, you know, engaged it in, engaged in, um, was uh, featured on a, I think it was Fox, Channel five. The channel five, yes. Mm -hmm. So that just goes to tell you that those are some of the things that have evolved right. through this. Like the whole staff in a building has done, you know, various things to show the students that they are thinking about them. And then at the high school level, they've done a very good job of now they've gone to video announcements. I saw the other day that one of the students is maintaining, um, like acting like a sportscaster. So he's giving updates and now they're like, going back and they're showing past uh, sporting events, like some of the you know, exciting ones where they've won a championship so that students can um, 
access those YouTube videos and see those past sport, sporting events. And then they have poems. And so at every level, I think it's that there's been a, yeah. a great job of reaching out to students and letting them know that we're thinking about them. Great. Thank you. Uh, my next question, quick question is- in Oh, Mr. Mr. McCarthy, McCarthy wanted to say something. Go Sorry, ahead. Mr. Hayter. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say, um, first, thanks to ACMI. They've been working with us on those video productions. That's been amazing. Um, we're working on updating those as well and getting more uh, more information from the students and more video. And um, I also wanted to say a lot of those pieces that Ms. McNeil just talked, Dr. McNeil just talked about were uh, student or teacher generated. Great. Um, which has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, question maybe to the chair, uh, is it appropriate to ask a question about MCAS now or should I wait on that? Uh, why don't we hold that for now? Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, is this where we're talking about all aspects of online schooling or is there gonna be more after this? Uh, I think that this would be an appropriate time to discuss. Okay, I don't have um, questions so much as comments that I've been hearing from parents. Um, first, that it's good for teachers to recognize uh, teachers and, and actually the whole staff of APS um, to recognize that parents are under a lot of different constraints that some are trying to do their own work or even work more because they're in healthcare or others um, from home while simultaneously oversee any schoolwork that their elementary school student or, or other students are doing and that flexibility, for example, uh, in terms of timing of assignments um, is really crucial that some parents ha don't have the ability to get to assignments until maybe the weekend when they have their free time. Um, uh, this next, so that's one thing. Uh, another is that many i'm hearing two different things one is it's good not to have not to require synchronicity for requirements but at the same time because it can be difficult to arrange in a household that maybe doesn't have tons of computers and has more than than one student working but at the same time it's been really nice for the students to have some kind of check in, not face to face, but screen to screen, say, um, in real time where they're able to meet with their, their um, with the other students and the teachers. And then the only other thing is that uh, one other question about communication is just if parents or others have suggestions about online schooling, ways to make it more effective, things that they feel aren't being addressed. How can those be effectively communicated to Arlington? And then if the te conversely, if teachers have needs that might be helpful, they might be able to get help from the community, how can those be communicated out? That's all. To your last question, um, I think that parents should contact the school principal. We as a administrative team and with teachers and coaches as well are in constant communication. So we would certainly know that, but I think that's the first place to go. And uh, teachers, the same, the same. They, they're working very closely with their principals. Um, the comments you made are, are exactly the, what we understand is also the challenges there's, this has been a tough time for everybody. You know, there's a lot of people that are very concerned and maybe have family members that, that have the COVID-19. So we are very aware of that. And any plan that we have going forward is going to be a blend of continuing what we're doing with having, um, working with Google Classroom, so it's asynchronous, but also um, trying to have some scheduled times where there can be face you know, screen to screen, as you say. So it, it needs to be a blend. We are not going to be, uh, 
this is the unanimous feeling among everybody in the district. We are not going to go to having regularly scheduled classes at nine in the morning and 10 in the morning. I mean, those, those schedules that were put out were just ideas of how to organize. I think that the one that the, uh, that the high school put out, Dr. Janger and his team uh, in the remote uh, learning document, it gives you another idea of how to just sort of think about this. And honestly, there are, there are students that are working right now because their families don't have an income and uh, were laid off. And so they don't have time during the school day either. So we know that we just have all of these different kinds of um, home situations that we need to be sensitive to. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Ms. Seuss, you're next. Nothing. Okay, Mr. Thielman. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I, to echo what others have said is um, there are families in the district who, you know, want uh, a replication of the regular school day. And, and then there are families uh, in the district who um, can't keep up with what's coming in from the schools and are confused and overwhelmed by it. So, you know, we have a wide range of people that are doing the best uh, they can in the community. And, um, but one thing has come up uh, that, I, that I've heard from people is, would there be, you know, and I know I heard Dr. Bodhi say earlier in the meeting that um, we uh, will be remediating um, a lot of what students lost in the first part of next year if we're not able to recover um, time in, the, in May and June. And even if we're able to may recover time in May and June, we still have to remediate next fall. But I'm, there are parents who have said, would it be possible to have some sort of a, a summer program in which remediation could take place? I don't know if this is the time for this question, but it seems like I couldn't figure out where else in the agenda it is. So that's why I'm asking. It. No, that's a, it's a great time for the question. It's a great question. Uh, we've actually talked about that, um, particularly the conversations going on um, at the high school. In fact, I was on a Medco meeting yesterday and we're talking about something in Boston as well. So yes, we're looking at it and it relates to actually one of the topics later on in our agenda, which talks about budget. Um, we, we'll just wait and see. We're, we're open to the idea. Uh, of course, like in any kind of idea like this, there's a lot of planning and details and of what, what we might be able to to do. And then, okay, and then one follow up question. Have you, um, how do you address, and another question did come up uh, in my own community, actually, my neighborhood is, you know, what, what is the plan for graduating seniors? Um, how, how are they going to get all the credits they need to graduate? Well, I have an answer, but since we have Mr. McCarthy here, maybe we could talk about that because they have done a lot of thinking. Uh, in the high school about seniors and where we're going with this. Um, we certainly, the seniors uh, have fallen into this. This is a of all the groups, this is a really tough for seniors because you yeah. know they may not have their proms and they may not have graduation as you know, years and years, decades and decades of students have had. But in terms of, and I'll, and I'll let Ms. McCarthy jump in here, the high school has done an extraordinary job of, of really reaching out to all kids who might be in danger of uh, graduating and have set up plans for them uh, to make sure they get the credits that they need. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, you want to add in some color to that? Absolutely. So um, first off, if we have any students that were in danger of failing, uh, we actually start tracking them. And by failing, I mean fail for the year we start tracking them in second semester. So we already had a pretty good list. Um, on Monday, we will store the grades from term three, uh, and that will give us a better picture of where we stand for those students that might fail a course for the year. Our standard protocol is to actually have our, uh, is to either uh, work with the teacher and the department heads, or curriculum leaders, to put together work, um, summer school, obviously, is an option as well. And we also have Plato, which is Edmentum Credit Recovery, which we do have a, a few students working on right now, knowing already that they were going to fail a course for the year. Um, with that, we've trained several TAs in the building 
to be working with those students uh, to support them, give them motivation, uh, tutor them when necessary, um, to help them really uh, grasp the material to be able to move forward. Now, with seniors, um, like you said, this is a very difficult position we're in because even if we return on May 4th, that leaves us three weeks of term four before we venture into uh, graduation. So I think we've been taking a very long look at how term four could be rolled out. Um, if it, and, and I think that's really gonna come down to a, a lot of conversations. I know we had a conversation, uh, Dr. McNeil, Dr. Bodie, myself, Dr. Jango, we had several conversations about this in the past uh, week and we're still hammering out the details on that piece. But it is something we're very aware of. We are keeping track of it. And um, like I said, on Monday, we are wrapping up term three with a grade store and we'll have a better picture of students that are in danger. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm good, Len. Great. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. I'm just wondering if we have a count of uh, students who are engaged uh, electronically and uh, how many students are being challenged to connect in, uh, not refusing, but just having a challenge to connect in through a remote environment? I don't know if, if it's a challenge at the, I think you, there's different challenges at different levels. Um, to your point about getting onto the network, I think some of there's been technical challenges at the lower grades where, um, we need parents to help students log in and we've gotten a number of emails. I don't understand, I don't know how to log in. I don't know what, what I do about a password, all of these kinds of very technical questions. Um, and then you have other issues as you move along the grade line, the grades. So I, I think we're solving the technical issues as they come up, but then we don't know what we don't know in terms of what people need. But if they do have a question, they certainly should approach their principal. Um, and I think that's in general, the best way of any kind of issues that come up is just to first go to the principal of the school or the assistant principals for sure. Uh, was there another part of that question I, I didn't answer? No, I was just trying to get a, a sense of the count of uh, how many students are successful in interacting versus how many students mm -hmm. have some sort of a barrier is coming up either a technological or something else. It's, it's sometimes it's the upper grade is not even technological because they all know how to go into, use their five pounder account to get into Google Classroom. Uh, that's not the issue, it's question, but they're not necessarily doing that either. And, and those are other issues. At the elementary level, um, the, the early grades, the participation is very high um, in any kind of contact. So um, we're, as the issues come up, we're, we're trying to, uh, to solve them as best as possible. Can you sort of define very high? Uh, technical issues? I, I think we've solved a lot of the technical issues. I think there's other issues that prevent uh, students from going on. Um, and that's why teachers are reaching out individually. At the, at the grade six through 12, they can reach out by email and that, that is happening. You know, like what's going on? How are you doing? Um, you know, you know I, I see you haven't been on Google Classroom because they can tell, they know who's not. Um, at the lower grades where we don't, even though they have email accounts, they're not activated. Teachers go directly to the parents and just do a check that way. Um, the participation in, in these, uh, these either Hangouts or Google Classroom, as I said, goes very high at the early grades and may go down to 40, 50%. Though I will say our AP classes, uh, the high participation um, going on as they get ready for the uh, AP exams, which have changed this year. Uh, Kathy, can I just add to that? We've kept some analytics on how many people have um, uh, reference the uh, enrichment page and we have over 32,000 uh, you know visits to the enrichment page at this particular point in time so th that can give you kind of an idea of the number of uh, it doesn't tell you individually about the you know participation rate 
but it does tell you that the interest that people have had or parents and students have had with contact. And I can't parse out how many of that have been teachers or whatever, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a very high, you know, we've had a lot of visits to the enrichment page. And, and I just want to emphasize what Mr. McCarthy said earlier about counselors and social workers and, and those individuals at the secondary level and also, you know, at the um, elementary level. So if kids are not reaching out. That's when I say that that's where that passion and dedication has come in because we've done a, a very good job from the things I've heard about reaching out to those people or those students who are not accessing um, a Google Classroom page or not accessing um, an activity. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Um, so I have a question um, also about communication, which obviously is a challenge. Um, and we are certainly a family that has had our share of technical issues with passwords that come from one person and say one thing and come from somebody else and are totally different. So that's been tough. Um, but, you know, I think we're getting there, which is exciting. Um, so. You know, what I'm hearing from parents at the high school level is that a lot of the communication from principals is going through the students, which is probably appropriate. Oh, I have a very angry dog. Hold on. Um, A lot of the communication is going through the students. um, And so the parents are really in the dark about what's going on because they're not getting the emails. And then my experience at the elementary level is that my kids, you know, my, my first grader can't really do email, but my older elementary kids could communicate with their teacher, but they can't because they don't have email. Um, and they're supposed to communicate through Google Classroom, either in some sort of chat that all of their classmates can see, or through some sort of like private chat function that they don't really understand and only is attached to a certain assignment. So they only want to talk about that assignment in that function. So it's this like kind of like interesting dichotomy where the feedback I get from high school parents is, oh my gosh, my students have all this information, but I have no idea what's going on. And then me, you know, in with my elementary kids and especially my upper elementary kids, my first grader, like I've got to manage it for him. I get that. But my fifth graders could be far more independent and they don't have the ability to do that because we haven't put the technology in place for them. So it seems to me that if we're emailing students at the high school level and we're asking parents to partner with us right now in a way we never have before, maybe it's appropriate to include them. Again, I don't have high school students, so you know this is just, but I've heard this from more than one family. Um, so, you know, that's that's the feedback that, you know, these are like really like technical nitty gritty things that, you know, we can probably improve on and, and make this just a little less painful for everybody. Well, the, the good suggestions. As far as the um, elementary, we are not going to activate the emails. We looked into it. Uh, you made that suggestion and we have looked at, into it and, and just decided at this point, that's not what we can do. If we can maybe send out some instructions to students and how they can have a private chat um, on Google Classroom, that may be something that we need to, to do. And we'll, we'll make a note to, to have that be a list of uh, you know, uh, information that we can pass on to the digital literacy team. Um, can I ask but so, as far I- as the, Mr. McCarthy's here, maybe we can get a little bit more communication out. Uh, to the high school, though I think a lot has gone out. I, I don't think all the emails, but you could speak to that. Um, yeah, so at the high school, what we've been trying to do, and this is long before the closure, um, we try and teach all of our students about um, the benefits of technology, email. Starting freshman year, they're signed up for Google Classrooms. We really put ownership on the students around their own education. Um, around the closure, what we've been doing, um, we've been posting everything we send out and details on our website. There's actually a link, uh, frequently asked questions around the school closure right on our homepage. Uh, We've been trying to keep the students informed and keep them up to date. And when we find students aren't connecting, that's when we've been reaching out to parents. Um, I definitely see the benefits of what you're talking about in terms of uh, perhaps attaching parent emails or the, the, the guardian list as well. To, to some of our broader emails, um, so that they can be um, they can be included in this process. Obviously, we want them to be included in this process and supporting the high school students. So, thank you. 
Great. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Anything else? Nope. All right. So I'll just add a couple of, of things um, you know, that I've been hearing and, and thinking about. Um, you know, as I said last meeting, I think you know, our, our plan should continue to evolve. It, it has been evolving and that's great to see uh, and hopefully it will continue to evolve. One of the things that I've heard is that the, you know, the two touches that we're requiring from teachers per week um, uh, is, is, is sort of inadequate. One of the touches is posting the assignments. So it's really just one touch that we're requiring. I know most teachers are doing much more, um, but, but not every, every teacher is. So I, I think looking at what some of the other districts have required, um, why not require office hours? Why not require one video chat? Um, per teacher per week. Why not require a little bit more structure? Um, I know some of the principles are, but it's 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 patchwork. So, again, moving forward as we evolve the, as we evolve this, um, I think a little bit more structure as to what the teachers are doing on a daily basis as far as this communication, with input from the teachers as to what it should be. Um, but but again, in the plan, documenting you know what's going to happen uh, would be great. Um, the other, the other comment is, um, you know, looking forward as this continues to roll out, um, you know, we're, Massachusetts is really becoming one of the exceptions that is, is recommending no advancement of the curriculum. So we need to be ready, you know, that first week of May, if this gets extended, it, it doesn't make sense to me to have our teachers going out and creating curriculum as Ms. Keys, you know, described to reinforce what was already taught. I mean, they're basically, you know, some, if you look at some of these lessons, they are teaching more. They're teaching more about the same subject, but they're teaching more. So, the, you know, the notion that they're, we're, we're trying to, to tiptoe around this equality issue, you know, the kids that aren't learning right now, it's terrible that the kids that, that they're not learning. Um, but the kids that are learning, we, 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 should think, we should be thinking more strategically about what we want them to be learning um, going forward. So those are my comments uh, and uh, uh, don't need a response. We can move on to the next item, which I think is April break. April break, yes. Um, as we've looked at what's going to be happening for the rest of the year, uh, there's still uncertainty about what will happen after May 4th, but one of the things that's happened since the last time we met is clarity from uh, the Department of Education as to the number of days that a district needs to be um, in session. And we don't have to uh, be in any more than 185 days. It's a little more nuanced than that, but for Arlington, what that would have meant is June 25th. Thursday, June 25th, which is the last meeting in, um, in the last week in June. A number of districts, um, and there's been a lot of discussion among superintendents on this over the last two weeks, have gone in the direction of, of not canceling April vacation for a couple of reasons. Some of it's actually been discussed here tonight, is that we are evolving and we have gotten a more structure. And I suspect as we move forward, we're gonna have more structure in, in what, what constitutes remote learning. But it's just starting to root and uh, more, more so in the last week and this week. And that if we go, if we have April break and have a complete break with what um, we have been doing, it may be very difficult to get back on track and take a little bit more uh, time. So that's been one of the main reasons why districts have thought about canceling vacation. Uh, and also, you know, if we come back, uh, and that's very unsure right now, we would be in the fourth week of June. And one of the things that's been true in Arlington Public Schools for many, many years is that our buildings are hot. Uh, they're, they're not, those, that time of the, of the year is not the most productive time just because of the environments that the students are learning in. So, uh, but this is not a, this is a decision that ultimately is the school committee's decision, but I wanted to get a pulse on where people were in the district, as well as once I knew that, to do a little bit of a testing of where uh, parents were on the issue. 
And in the last couple of days, we, we have surveyed uh, uh, staff, um, all units of the AEA, the Education Association. And I've also um, uh, looked at um, surveyed administrators. And in both staff, both in district staff, the majority favor canceling vacation. Today, we sent out a quick uh, uh, notice to parents letting them know what I was going to recommend this evening, which is that we cancel April vacation. Uh, and also asked if they would like to weigh in on that, that recommendation. And we had um, 1,120 responses, of which 86% uh, favor canceling uh, the vacation. In, there was, 120 parents who wanted both. They wanted us to cancel vacation, but also wanted us to continue school um, through June 25th. And um, in terms of the finances of this, that's really not an option in terms of the cost. Uh, to have the cost, to have a regular school day beyond what is our contractual year would be about $240,000 per day in that realm. But that was only 120 out of the um, close to um, 1120 responses that we had. So there seems to be some unanimity around this issue that it makes sense to cancel April vacation. We're doing that not knowing what's going to be recommended about closure but it made sense just in terms of the continuity and the evolution of what we're doing um, in the district. And so I, I present that recommendation to you and ask um, for your support of that. All right, let's go around on this one, Mr. Hainer. Just to clarify, um, is the Department of Education or the, the state treating all days since the closure as school days with the exception of the April vacation? Um, the answer is yes, but on the other hand, they're also saying that all districts should go to 185th day. So if you have four, uh, if you cancel vacation, have four school days in the April vacation, in terms of what we've been talking about, they're not, there are remote learning days, then you can all, you can go to your 181st day. Arlington's 181st so, day is okay. Okay, so just just I, I want to just repeat it again. All days that have not been in the classroom since the closure, once the school opens up, those days will not, will be considered regular school days. That's correct. With the exception of an April vacation, if you took an April vacation. Correct. Okay, so the intent is to uh, cut back five, four days or five days? Four. Four, because the, the first day would be considered a holiday, am I correct? Well, it's, a, it's a state holiday, yes. State holiday. So we're looking to recover four days at the end of the year, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ellis and Ampey? Um, I appreciate that Dr. Bodie, that you did this survey, I do wish that it had been done earlier in the week and given people a longer time to respond. Um, I'm glad that we got over a thousand responses though. Um, in my experience with that many, I think no matter how long the survey would have been open, we would have gotten something similar. Mm -hmm. um, I do wanna to speak to the people who were pro break um, there are a lot of families out there who are feeling like school is hard on them and that they could use a break, that it's hard overseeing work and school. Um, and, uh, but I do understand that losing momentum is a problem. Um, I'm still thinking, but thank you for the information. You know, it's it's mixed feelings in the district too. Uh, I will say that um, maybe Ms. Keys can also talk to this because she's seen all the responses from the AEA. But 
you know, people are tired. I, people have been working very hard these last couple of weeks and it's stressful on trying to also balance your own family life. And a lot of our families, our, our teachers have young children at home as well. So this has been ex exhausting, but I think when people thought about this, on balance, what made the most sense? And and I, I would like to just pass a little time over to Ms. Keith, who might want to talk about this too. Yeah, so we surveyed our membership earlier this week and there was a comfortable majority that supported closing um, or clo canceling vacation and being open for school that week. Um, there, you know, it's most of the people who voted for that said they were doing it because they felt the kids were getting into a rhythm and they didn't want to disrupt that with the online learning. There were still a large number of comments that we got in our surveys that people were overwhelmed, they were stressed, they were burned out, that they've been trying to do a full-time job, be a full-time parent, or they're worried about, you know, their people in their household who are essential workers and still going to work or elderly family that they can't go see and that just the stress of this has really been a toll. And as much as they feel that it would be good for kids to keep going, it's all they could really use a break as well. Um, so I think there's support for canceling the vacation, but with some trepidation that like, this is hard and not you know, losing that prospect of a break is hard. If I could make one other, thank you, that, that's very helpful. Um, if I can make one other comment, um, just in terms of communication, I know there's some confusion. This isn't to, to, um, the teachers union, this is back to the administration. I know there's some co confusion about how we count the number of days and, and when we do it. And I know that that's partly because of the way that Desi said, well, some of these days count as snow days and, and all this stuff. And just if we could make it really clear where the day counting is coming from um, when in whatever written communication we send out about this, that would be helpful because people are like confused because they're like, well, we only had one snow day. Why are they counting something else? And, and it's because of the very specific requirements that have come down from DESE. That's all. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Seuss. Nothing, all right, Mr. Thielman. I don't have anything to add. I'm, I'm going to vote in favor of this. I think everyone's covered everything that I want to bring up. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, thank you for uh, bringing this forward. I've been tracking two things. One, I've been tracking on the MASC listserv the uh, number of districts who are uh, voting to go forward uh, during the normal April vacation. And there's a whole bunch of them who are either going that way for the full four days or are going to at least do three days out of the four. Um, and, I, and I was a little anxious about doing it at first, but uh, the more I read what's going on out there, uh, the more I make sense. One of the parents who wrote to me said, you know, we were planning to go to Disney uh, over the April vacation. And with the canceled trip, uh, being in school sort of eases the pain on that. Uh, a bit so that it won't feel as lonely being stuck at home on a vacation without without school going on. Uh, we're recognizing the difficulties. We don't know what's going to happen in May. We don't know how it's going to fall out. Um, but I think that it is a reasonable move to uh, keep on going, especially as we're reaching the peak of the curve and anything that keeps kids in and connected to learning rather than outside um, without a structured activity, I think is a good thing. That's why I'm going to go and vote to support this. Great, thank you, Ms. Morgan. 
Um, I'm going to support it too. I think it's the right thing to do with the information we have right now. Um, I will say that if I thought there was a realistic chance that we were going to go back and finish the year, there is nothing that I want more for my kids than, and for all of our kids than to have four more days with their teachers. I actually don't care how hot those buildings are. I don't care. I want every kid who needs reading support and who gets one more meeting with their occupational therapist or their physical therapist or my first grader who's teacher is so phenomenal. If I thought there was any chance I could get that to my kids and to all of these kids in Arlington, I would vote against this because I think that getting four days in the classroom is so much better than the lousy job I'm doing delivering this at home. Um, but I don't think that that's what's going to happen. And so I think, you know, we're having to make decisions without full information. But I do, you know, I do want people in the community to understand that we're not doing this, you know, that, that we're not doing this because things at home are going so great <laughs> and that this is just like such great learning and that somehow, but, and, and I really can't say strongly enough that if I thought there was a chance I could get my daughter back with her ELA teacher or my son back with his fifth grade teacher for four more days that I wouldn't do it. But I don't think that we can. So I think the right thing to do is to keep going and do the best we can. And the way to do the best we can with what we have is to do what we're doing now. So. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, what Ms. Morgan said. I, I think it's very unfortunate that the state structured this as a as a kind of trade-off. I, I think they muddled the waters a bit. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that we, as a district, sort of jumped on it as, as a trade-off. But given where we are, I mean, I, I do think there are separate issues. And if, if we do reopen, if there's a miracle happens and we reopen, then I think we can definitely negotiate with the union as to whether we have those four additional days and how much that costs given that they've been, you know, everybody's been working very hard, but has not been working full time. So, and, and, you know, hundreds of companies are furloughing people and people working temporarily or getting pay cuts. So that's something we can address. And in, in, if a miracle happens and we get back to school uh, and as chair, I, I, you know, I commit to doing that uh, at a future meeting if that happens, but given what we know now, um, uh, I think we need to plow through April break so we don't interrupt the learning. Uh, again, for uh, just so everybody understands, it is it is just four days because of the holiday on Monday. We're also continuing, you know, for now, we're just continuing these enrichment type activities. Uh, so if there are families who want to take a break, um, then certainly they can take a break uh, and they should um, for all or part of that week. Um, but, uh, uh, where we are now, I think it makes sense to go ahead and, and, and do the learning over that break. So can I get a motion to uh, have remote learning days for those four days during what was supposed to be April break? So move. Second. Mr. Shipman seconded. Okay, we'll do a roll call. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Aye. Dr. Alice Nampy. Aye. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Aye. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I'm yes as well. Thank you. All right, so the next item is a budget update, uh, both because it's uh, we haven't had one for a while and, and uh, related to any um, uh, COVID-19 impact or issues that have come up. Uh, so Dr. Bodie or Mr. Mason? I, I will turn this over to Mr. Mason in just one second. You received um, in your um, Anobis uh, a look at where we are at this point. There, there are clearly some savings compared to where we were a month or two ago that's related to COVID. There's also other, other expenses that are being tracked related to COVID as well. Um, but this is a snapshot of where we are right now. Um, it, uh, it may not be exactly where we are later on. And I, and I will just preface this by saying that we're also going into a very uncertain time in our state uh, in terms of what, what we could possibly expect next year and for that matter, even the following year in terms of revenue and how this could be impactful uh, to schools. 
Um, so we are very mindful of that as we as we think about next year. And right now, our commitment has been to all of the, our staff, whether they're hourly workers or not, that we are paying them through this school year. And uh, that is reflected in this in this budget. So I'm gonna let Mr. Mason sort of give another overview of it and see if there's any specific questions you might have. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, so tonight, your normal presentation as you get your normal documents that this is for the period ending of March 31st. And you know, I really wanna focus on the general fund or the town appropriation uh, side of the report, um, which does show an increase of uh, balance that we're anticipating about $983,000. Uh, and once again, that's um, mainly driven by um, savings and out of district tuition, but as well as now everything is starting to slow down. And so um, at this point, I mean, as we've been focusing on trying to get re remote learning uh, built up, uh, I think that we'll start to see uh, some focusing on trying to also prepare for next school year as, as our department heads would normally do at this time of the year. Um, it's been very hard to project the expenditures um, uh, due to this, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and some of the challenges that, you know, that came with this is, you know, trying to see how we normally spend. And, you know, we had to look at, okay, where, where, where are our upticks? And normally uh, we do spend a little bit more in the beginning of the year and towards the end of the year. And so about 40% of our spending is in the, in the last quarter. And so that's some of the, 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 the issues that were difficult to kind of project this, um, as well as understanding, you know, as much as we want to support some of DESE, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's guidance in regards to trying to ensure payment to certain vendors, such as collaboratives out of um, other uh, special education, out of district uh, service providers and transportation vendors, um, there are sometimes that we're, we're at odds with two different uh, legislations where chapter 71 section 68 points out that we do have to provide transportation for for certain children and where chapter 4156 says that uh we only pay for services that are rendered and so th this projection can change if 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 depending on how the state decides how we should actually handle payment and that will also come on with the comptroller's decide on how if we can actually make these payments to some of these uh, vendors. Um, also, as you know, part of the projection, it was difficult to determine the, the, the impact of the revenue because we don't know when we're going to go back in session or if we're going to go back in session at all. Um, so you'll see that also in this, in this report. Um, and so we're, you know, as well, we're, we're considering the refunds, but we're, we're waiting to see how the rest of the year will be like. Uh, before going forward with that. And we, part of, you know, trying to manage the budget and trying to think forward is we don't know what the revenue will look like on the state level and how that will be funded to the town and how our budgets may be affected. So we are trying to be uh, proactive in the sense of reallocating uh, uh, some of our revolving expenses and to give us some kind of buffer uh, in the outward out, out time frames, and I think that basically kind of explains where we at in terms of uh, the you know what we it, what it took to kind of go into this projection. But you'll also notice that the revolving funds in, in this report is uh, we're possibly going to not spend as much in the revolving funds just in case we can spend even more next year if our budget is impacted on the the town appropriation side. Okay, uh, Mr. Mayor, before you, before you start, I just point out that I, I mean, I think we as a committee need to look at um, policies regarding refunding of fees, proration of fees, 
um, and I particularly for the bus fee and the preschool fee, which is a fee that we set. But I think we also need to look at at um, the revolving funds uh, that are supposed to be self sufficient, like the after school program and our, our faculty daycare program, as to whether um, it really is is you know we're also paying the employees, and I know that private daycares and 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 all that are are uh, requesting continued payments. But I think that's something that uh, I'd ask the budget subcommittee to to take a look at um, going forward. So, Mr. Hayner, go ahead. Uh, going on along with what you just said, I, students that were in out of district placements uh, full time that have returned home, would we be entitled to uh, a reimbursement of that fee as well, or is that something we need to look into? Um, the state has the state has asked districts to pay those tuitions as if they were in school. The, the reasoning behind that is that should we um, go back to school um, and the students return to their, their placements out of district, that those could be staffed and continue as they had been. So we're, we're not asking for reimbursements at this time. And, and to Mr. Cardin's point, we have a lot of programs, the flip in, in Arlington is that, that they're fee-based and we've made a commitment to continue to pay the salaries of, of uh, people who are in those types of programs, such as after school or daycare and there, or the before and after school preschool program. There's just a lot of programs that are totally fee-based. And um, we, we do need to take a look at that. I think that um, the budget subcommittee should meet and discuss this as we go forward. But right now, the state is asking all districts to pay for those tuitions and I the think, transportation. I think that's wonderful and I would support the concept, but at the same time, I feel the state and the federal government with all the money, we're an entity too, and we have to survive. So by us supporting these groups, we also should be eligible to some sort of reimbursement or recognition that we are doing our part as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Alice Nampi, anything? Um, nothing to add. I'm hearing what you're setting up for, I mean, what people are requesting the budget look into and we'll set up a meeting soon. Thank you. Ms. Seuss, anything? Nope. Uh, Mr. Thielman? So are we projecting enough of a savings to support any kind of a summer remediation program? Michael, is that your, what's your sense? Um, I, I believe we can support a summer program, but I think that, uh, more, you know, more discussions need to happen with, between me and Kathy and the administration. Okay. I mean, um, I don't mean to harp on this, but I mean, does, has anyone done any est estimates at all, like a range of what it might cost to do summer remediation or not yet? Um, I think the closest we've been looking at is what we already offer, which is um, our, our, our special education programs in the summer and um, what the cost of those programs are, which is something that the district assumes. So we do have some basis for having an idea of what this would cost. But also one of the things that is even a challenge with that program is staffing it every year. And uh, so the, it's, it's 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 like so many things when you start digging into the details of how you would administer it or organize it it gets so it gets much more complicated and would seem at least initially so yes we're, we're looking at it and we and mr mason and i have talked about that is how we could because that would be in a new fiscal year another another thing that you should all be aware about aware of is that we Right now, it'd be possible if we don't have town meeting, don't have approved budgets, that we can use one twelfth of the FY20 in in FY beginning in July. Now, whether we would go two months like that is another issue because because I did hear the other day that the legislature is probably not going to pass their budget until August. 
So that puts us in a little bit of a difficulty in that any of the increases that we had in our budget uh, due to increases for FY21 really will not be available money possibly July 1. And so we're recalibrating right now in terms of what is that going to mean in terms of hiring for next year. So there's, there's layers and layers of complexity in all of this. Um, but I feel I, we are in a very good position in our district, better than what I've heard in other districts. Um, so I feel very good about that. And I feel, I feel good that we're going to be able to pay all of our staff uh, through the rest of this year. And that's important. And it takes a lot of, for the, those people, it takes a lot of anxiety out of what they're going through too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Seuss, did you have something? Oh, yeah, I mean, you sort of answered it, but just the question about whether uh, we'll potentially get some flexibility about using any extra money it, after the fiscal year ends, if you've seen any discussion about that. Um, and then if not, and I know most of our budget is salaries, but is there are there one-time expenses that, that we're supposed to be spent in FY21 that we can shift to FY20 with any of the money that we have left over um, to free up budget stuff in FY21? The, the answer is yes. And one of the, one thing, for example, is prepaying three months of tuitions for out of district. That's something that we could be looking at. Um, Certainly money that is in the special ed stabilization or, or in our revolving accounts can also help us as well. But um, even though we can have one twelfth of our budget go in through July, it doesn't change the fact that the fiscal year ends June 30th. So that's what we are having our eye on in terms of trying to figure this out to create as much um, buffering as we can possibly manage. Okay, um, Mr. Oh, Schiffman. Uh, Al, Ms. Selmer has her hand up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Ms. Selmer, go ahead. Sorry, I was doing it digitally too, but I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, I just wanted to, back to Mr. Hainer's um, question around tuition and to Mr. Mason's point, while we have been advised to pay those tuitions, obviously, so those services remain available when we do resume. However, what has not been determined is how the circuit breaker reimbursement will work. So I do think people need to factor that into our discussions. Um, I was on the call with Jay Sullivan today, who is, um, who is in charge of that, and um, they have not figured out if they, they want us to pay the tuitions, but they have not determined if we will be reimbursed at the regular rate for those tuitions during that period. So I do think if you um, were asking around what pressure we need with our legislature around that, um, I, I do think we need to advocate that if we are going to be paying full tuitions that we should be getting our regular reimbursement on that. The other um, thing that I do think we need some additional voices uh, is the other governmental agencies who have responsibilities. So DPH um, oversees early intervention. Um, students age out of early intervention at three and under which that time they become the responsibility of the public school district if they're eligible for an IEP. DPH is not extending coverage for students after the age of three. Um, they announced that this week that they do not have plans to do that. Um, similarly, DDS is not at a place where they can intake students turning 22. So at this point, the only responsible agency is the public school system. So there's a question of when those students turn three, do they become the responsibility of the public school system if we hadn't had the opportunity to evaluate them and, turn, and um, determine whether they're eligible for IEP services. Um, for the reasons I mentioned earlier to Ms. Morgan around evaluations evolve face-to-face -face, um, assessments. Similarly, for the students who are 20, turning 22, the suggestion would be that the schools would continue to keep the 22 year olds on um, in their placements um, because they can't move on to DDS. So I do think we need some support um, in you know, the legislative decisions or policymakers who are also making those decisions. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Shipman, you're next. 
thank you. Um, I just wanted to make one sort of a, a, a side remark here in terms of our budget and that we still uh, spend less than the state average. And one of the places where uh, we are spending less is that we do have a very lean administrative staff. So when we have a crisis such as this, I mean, nobody was sitting around saying, well, what are we gonna do with school if there was a pandemic and we had to close down? And a lot of the stuff we've had to do is either been in-house or involved cooperation and sharing with others. And so when the question becomes, well, if Cambridge is doing this and this, or if Burlington is doing something, or if Weston is doing something, uh, we're, we're, we're comparing ourselves to districts that have a much higher per pupil spending and a much larger administrative staff. So I just wanna say within the context of the budget right here, we're working very lean, we recognize this so that what we're doing with a relatively lean staff, I think is pretty amazing. Uh, being a former central administrator, I, I know how difficult this is when, when this has to land on a limited number of people. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's doing this work. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Morgan? Nothing? All right. Um, so I uh, don't really have anything else to add. Just, um, I mean, obviously, well, as things roll forward, we're going to have to continue to look at the FY21 budget. Um, you know, we may need to prioritize which positions we fill and which ones we don't and all that. Um, but that, that will be uh, something going forward that we'll need additional guidance on. Um, and Michael, I, I, I believe the, the Federal CARES Act did have some funding which is gonna roll out through the Title I formula. I don't know if we've gotten any indication of how much money we'll get through that yet. No, we have not gotten any indication. It was, it was actually, it seemed like a very low amount that it would uh, be allocated to the state of Massachusetts about, I think uh, Jay Sullivan was around, said about 50 to $55 million that would have been allocated additional to the Title I. So I, I don't really know how much Arlington will receive of these funds. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, you had in the agenda other things related to this? It, on the agenda is yeah, the so, so, Right, so, so that, that that was what, uh, anything, anything else you wanna add? Um, and we could also discuss the, um, the, the high school program of studies adjustments here. Oh, that's exactly what I was gonna suggest as we go into that. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, is, is Mr. McCarthy still here? There are in your in your Novus um, folder, you'll find uh, uh, the list of topics that are in the program of studies that really are not applicable to our current situation. And um, Mr. Cardin has requested and. And, and actually was a, an excellent idea is to look at all of the places in the program of studies where the school committee should vote that they're just waived for this year. And so the high school administration has put together that list and you have it. And I don't know if um, you want, if Mr. McCarthy would like to speak to that because I know you were part of, part of the process of developing it. And what we would like to have from you tonight, though it could wait, I mean, it could wait to the next meeting too, is a waive, is a motion to waive these requirements in the program of studies. Uh, okay, do, do people wanna, I don't know if how, how much people got a chance to look at them. Do we want uh, Mr. McCarthy to, to run through them quickly or, or not? I have the list here. There's, it goes into all the, the the description of it, but they it has to do about fin having final exams, the weighting that uh, we do for credit and grades, the AP exams, the attendance policy, community service. Uh, you know, we have 40 hours of community service for our graduates, and then the PE requirement. So those are the key things in the program of studies that we are just not gonna be able to meet 
the, meet those as described there and, and need a waiver. All right, Mr. Hainer, go ahead. This waiver is just for this year? Yes. Okay, thank you. I will, I'll, I'll support that for this year only. Uh, should we go through that list? Dr. Allison Yappy, any questions? Um, no questions. It makes sense that we should do something and I'm in, I'm in support of this. Ms. Seuss, anything? Oh, I'm just confused. Um, so are we only talking about the highlighted sections? Or it seems like there is more to be waived. Mr. McCarthy? Um, actually, unfortunately, I don't have the document in front oh, of me. Let, me. let me go down. I have it right here. Um, it's really just the requirements that they're, they're highlighted because these are um, requirements in the program of studies, but it's anything about final exams. There's a lot of language about you know, having them and um, uh, the instrument and the evaluation and the weighting. That just all has to go because we're, we probably are not going to have final exams. So it's just all of the language around final exams in the program of studies. Um, then there's a whole section on how you weight uh, the work uh, in terms of a final grade. And some of that has already happened with uh, language went out to students and to parents in the high school in terms of how the, for term third, for the third term, how that was weighted differently than is in the program of studies. The whole issue of weighted GPAs uh, needs to change. Advanced placement tests, one of the requirements was that if you take an AP course that you uh, take the exam the exams this year are going to be done remotely. They're 45 minute exams now. Um, and um, so we're just, we're not requiring students because they're remote exams to have to take the remote test. There's, there's very clear language about attendance policy um, in terms of how many, are, what is excused, what's not excused, how many you can have per term. And while some of that all was operational until we hit third term, it's no longer gonna be true for fourth term. So that needs to be waived. Um, so, sorry. And Just then, well, so the other one is graduation requirements. One of the other graduation requirements has to do with uh, physical education. So that needs to be waived because we can't really do that right now. Uh, and so just to that was the list. So just to, just in terms of the of the motion, uh, I, I think Ms. Hughes is, is correct in being a little bit confused. I, I think the motion would be to grant the requests or proposals. So in, within the document, sometimes it uses the word request and sometimes it uses the word proposal. Um, it's not highlighted, but that's sort of what they're asking us to do. So in each section, there is a either a request or a proposal, and uh, by approving that that we are by approving that document, we are approving those proposals and requests. Did I clarify it? Sorry, I misunderstood what you were asking me. No, no, I'm just asking Ms. Seuss if that clarified what, mm -hmm. what action is being requested of us. Yeah, yes, it does, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thielman, anything? I, I'm good, I don't have any questions. Mr. Shipman. Yeah, I was a little puzzled at first as to uh, uh, why something was highlighted green, something was highlighted yellow, and negotiating through what, what the actual request was, uh, basically from the format of this, but uh, uh, these waivers seem necessary and I'm prepared to vote in favor of it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Um, for my only question is for semester for so for semester one courses though they've taken their final exams and those will be w weighted as normal or so we're, sorry yeah I can just explain that um, a full year course um, it is divided up and I'm not going to go down to the fractions but I believe it's um, 23 23 23 23 um, 10 percent for each term in the final exam. 
I know my math is off on that. Sorry, I was an English teacher. Um, what we'd be looking to do is, is remove that, that um, the weighting of the final exam. Now for a semester course, uh, their final exam is actually factored into the overall semester grade. So it doesn't come out separately. That's only for semester and quartered classes. What we're looking for is the year long courses. Got it. And semester one though, courses that just met for semester one are fine. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, great. So can I get a motion to approve the requests and proposals within the document presented? So move. Second. There a second. Second. All right, we'll do the roll call. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Aye. Ms. Seuss? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And uh, I'm yes as well. All right, thank you. And Dr. Bodie, are there any other COVID-19 updates that we should be talking about tonight? Not tonight, but I'm sure that there will be more as we evolve on this, the next meeting. Um, and some of them have to, some of it has to do with the issue of credits and no credits, but th that can wait until the next meeting. Um, on the agenda, okay. you, yeah, so I think we're, we're, we're fine right now. Before, um, yeah, let me just, um, just if anybody else has anything they want to raise, uh, wave your hand on this. Nope. All right, go ahead, Dr. Oh, yeah, Mr. Shigman, go ahead. Um, yeah, the, yeah the, the, the one question I have, and I think Mr. Hainer wanted to bring it up, and I think this is the place where it needs to go is the topic of MCAS. So I don't think that, it, you know, right now is the time to go into a detailed dis, uh, description of it because I think we stand a chance of having uh, a further uh, DESE advisory come forward uh, before the next meeting, but uh, it, it's certainly not gonna be a valid measure if they try to go and, and do the testing if we should come back so uh, I'd like to have that uh, as a placeholder in the agenda for the next meeting. Um, I just wanna give a, a little bit of an update on that, though it's not really much. Um, there are two components to MCAS in terms of permissions to do something that would be an evolution of it. One is you have to have a, a waiver from the federal government because the federal government requires uh, standardized testing. You also have to have um, a legislative action in Massachusetts. It is not the decision of the Department of Education about MCAS. So right now the Department of Education has submitted a waiver to uh, the U.S. Department of Education. In fact, I think almost every state has and we have been uh, the, the email back was basically interpreted as yes, we agree with the waiver. And I've, I've read since that they've, they've given waivers for all states. But now there's legislation uh, in, the, in our uh, legislative, um, both the Senate and the House to, I think the, I think the language of it is going to be to uh, allow the commissioner to make the decision about MCAS. That legislation hasn't passed yet. There's a lot of things in that. And so we're, that's where we are right now. Great, Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Uh, unless I got it wrong, the Boston Globe today said that the the legislature uh, and other uh, governor were going to see the decision whether to have MCAS or not over to the commission, uh, DESE. My biggest concern is those seniors that have not passed the MCAS requirement for graduation. I'm worried about them. A lot of, a lot of kids pass it in the sophomore year, the junior year. I'm just really concerned that, and I realize this, the federal government and everybody else has it, Will those waivers, and you may not, I don't think you're going to be able to answer that tonight, 
cover those kids. Thank you. The only thing I can say Good. is that the commissioner is very well aware of all those issues around this. That's all I can say. I have no further information. He was quoted as saying that the MCAS should go forward. Right. Go ahead, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. McCarthy. Just speaking on behalf of the high school, um, at current, I can tell you there are uh, two students that we're currently working with who need MCAS to graduate. One we're doing a little more digging on. Um, we may be able to do a cohort appeal but we are waiting to hear back from the state. So right now it is two students that are being impacted by this, uh, but they are being worked with, with um, Mr. McKnight and Ms. Tivnan, our Dean of Students, are both working with those students, trying to come up with plans to get those supports that they need. The cohort appeal, does that allow for a graduation and diploma if it's successful? Yes. Thank you. All right, great, thanks. So uh, next I had put on the agenda, um, Student Opportunity Act plan update, um, the legislation which did pass today, I don't know if the MCAS was in there, I didn't check, but the, um, the SOA deadline was in the le legislation that was passed today and is waiting for the governor to sign. Uh, it extends the deadline to May 15th or a date later determined by the commissioner. So. We have at least until May 15th, but um, possibly longer. Um, but can you just give us a, sort of an update on, on where our plan was and uh, you know, what, what we're gonna do to move it forward, uh, assuming that we need to this, this spring? Um, we've, we actually were quite far along with it, not in, not in terms of the templates that we had to fill out, but in terms of um, the plan itself, which was, which was actually pretty, there wasn't much of a change in terms of what we had put forward with the um, the budget uh, in tr with the the things that we were planning to do next year to close the uh, to minimize the achievement gap. So we have we know what we're doing. I think one issue that's out there that still has to be resolved is that this is based on money that you receive. And um, that's not at all clear either. So we have uh, communities that are expecting to have millions of dollars that they have to write a plan on. And in our case, um, we are going to receive under this, that legislation, two million on paper, <laughs> on paper, because we have, a, we have a formula in Arlington how monies uh, come into the school district. But what I can say is that 75%, 1.5 million is based on our efforts up to, you know, this last year and the year before and continuing them and the 500,000 of additional new money toward um, the plans that we had in the FY21 budget. And I think this is all waiting to see what happens on that. But are we, once we get the templates, we're ready to go and fill them up. I, I guess I'm confused because some districts did submit a plan. So how did they do that without the templates? I don't know how they did it without the templates because we have we have the, with the sample ones, but we haven't received, as far as I'm aware, we haven't received them. Okay. Are there any questions from the committee? All right. Great. Uh, superintendent's report, including AHS. Um, we met as a uh, building committee this last Tuesday and received reports as we always do from our uh, OPM contractor and our, our designer. I think uh, one of the, the most important things I need to tell you about is where we are with Parmenter. We, we know that we're probably going to be off schedule now with the Parmenter um, build out. Uh, because some of our trades, the beginning with the carpenters and I think painters and some others um, are not, not that they're on strike, it's that they are doing work stoppage due to uh, COVID-19. When that, when they will go back to work is not clear, but the parameter schedule was very tight. And even throwing it off by two weeks, three weeks is really puts in jeopardy whether we will actually uh, be able to have an occupancy uh, for September. So we, 
have been in discussion about plan B, sometimes plan C in terms of what we would do with the preschool for next year. And um, I, I can give you more information on that as we work it through. At this point, there are, there's not too many options. The one that was presented by our OPM was to have modular classrooms. Their challenge with that are twofold. One is the cost that would take away from the high school project which we probably shouldn't do because there's all we're going into an uncertain time in that area too, in terms of costs and timelines and so forth. But um, additionally, I'm not sure, even sure where we'd put them. That's another problem. So we, we are developing plans on, on that. And um, I can give you more information later. But as far as other things go there, we're, we've had transition meetings um, and we have actually, there's plans to begin toward the end of April, some of the pre-preparation uh, that, that goes, that needs to go on before construction can begin. And we've talked about that before. Uh, some of that has to do with, you know, clearing trees in the, the park area along the drive, setting up fencing. And so there, ha there were big packages that the, the committee uh, did approve. Uh, how the timeline of the high school is going to be affected by uh, COVID-19 and, and the trades um, not working at the moment, or what is it going to be the impact on, on obtaining materials uh, over the next uh, year is still all very uncertain as to how that will evolve. But certainly the building committee is aware of all these issues and um, our, our, our Planning as best possibly can with that as uh, with our with our design team. The other thing that uh, that the building committee was informed about is a change in where the parking lot is going to be for the high school during the uh, during construction or during the, all the different phases. At one point, they were going to be split on the east side and the west side, and now the parking is going to be concentrated all around where the basketball courts are. Um, there's some positives to that because there was some issues of, uh, of movement or down Schuler court. If that was also going to be, um, if that was also going to be where the parking lot was going to be for the, for some of the staff. So it, it's something that we need to inform the high school staff about once these plans become more finalized as to parking. But a positive on it is we're going to have more parking places than we would have on the previous plan. So that's, that's good. And so everything else is sort of moving forward as best as can. Um, the plan continues to have the build out of the Downs House for administration, guidance, and nursing. But uh, again, there's, that could be affected by some of these issues as well. And basically, I think that's it. We the uh, the communication subcommittee is working on a um, a blog to explain the what's going on with geothermal, and that will probably be um, out in the next week or so. I don't know if uh, if Mr. Thielman or Dr. Allison uh, Ampy want to add anything to that, but that's essentially where we are. I I think you covered it, Kathy. I don't have anything to add. And we've got three meetings planned during April vacation. Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. former L a a April vacation. The only thing that I'd add is that the blog is just a recap of how the geothermal decision was made and, and the rationale behind um, the decision to eliminate geothermal wells. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Great. Um, Mr. Schlickman has his hand up. Yeah, I noticed the town sent out an alert that there's going to be work in front of the high school uh, starting in the next couple of weeks. Yes, and we're we're also going to be communicating that to Abutters um, people that both some of it's hand some of it's hand delivered and some of it's just sent out by email. All of that will be beginning. Mr. Ainer, uh, the Monuments that are out there, have they all been uh, relocated and stuff? That's a Mr. McCarthy question. He's in charge of that committee. 
the monuments that are out there on the in the front lawn, Bill. Yes, the the memorials committee. Uh, I chair the memorials committee for the building. Uh, right now, the plan is to take those memorials and put them in storage during the construction. Obviously, the sites will. Um, it's actually only a handful because a lot of the memorials that are out there are going to remain. Okay. Mainly the ones that are embedded by trees along that sidewalk will remain. The other ones will be collected and stored safely while we determine their placement. Uh, we're in the process of contacting those families that might still have connections to these memorials uh, to work out placement if they do want to continue its placement at the high school or if they want to cease uh, that piece. So we'll, we'll give updates as that comes along. Uh, I would ask you to communicate that with the Veterans Council and things of that nature so that if the family makes a determination not to, the Veterans Council would may want to pick it up. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, great. Anybody else? Okay. okay. Consent agenda. All items listed are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. But we only have the approval of warrant number 20243, dated 331 2020, in the amount of 261 977.04. Is there a motion? So move. Second. Second. All right, Mr. Schuckman seconded. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Hayner. Yes. Dr. Ellison Ampey. Yes. Ms. Seuss. Ms. Seuss, didn't hear you. You're on mute, hon. You're on mute there. Am I still muted? No. Sorry. Okay. I, sorry about that. User error. Yes. No problem. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schuckman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I'm also yes. All right. Uh, are there any, I'm not gonna go through the list. Are there any committee reports? Mr. Schuckman. Uh, thank you. Uh, the superintendent search process committee I had an RFP out with the intent of doing a lot of the work this spring. Uh, we're obviously not going to be able to do that, and the deadlines that we had incorporated into the RFP are deadlines we no longer can can work with. Uh, my question is to the committee um, and also to Mr. Mason, uh, do we uh, revoke, repeal, put aside this RFP and uh, and revise it when we're a little more clear of what our timeline's going to be. Um, uh, so the, I guess the first question to Mr. Mason, uh, what are the technicalities about uh, uh, doing a do-over? Um, well, if you wanted to make any changes to dates, that would be a cause, that would be a reasonable reason to do another uh, RFP. However, um, you could also continue forward with the current RFP, but provide the updates to your, your selected vendors. Yeah, I, my, my instinct is that we should probably go out with a new RFP when we have a sense of what our new timeline might be uh, once we emerge from the current uh, situation. Uh, but that's just my opinion. I think that... Uh, we may want to put this on the agenda for a future meeting so that everybody has a chance to think about it and have uh, details put forward. Uh, I don't want to be surprising folks with a discussion or a vote tonight, but I just want to raise the issue. All right, uh, Mr. Hainer. Just a quick question, Paul. Why is there a reason we can't, it can't, can't be done remotely? In other words, send it out, get responses and, and the initial part of it? Well, the question is, is we were very specific about what we expected the vendor to be doing and when we expected that to happen. And our, our original RFP had a timeline of uh, focus groups and meetings with the community uh, in April, May, June. Uh, that's not gonna happen, obviously. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, I don't know where we're going to be or what our ability is going forward to uh, uh, put together a process. Uh, and, and I think that we should consider where we're going uh, in terms of uh, what, what the search is gonna look like and, and re-advertise. I would support uh, a, an agenda item uh, as soon as possible for a discussion by the committee to do just what Paul said. Uh, all right, we can we can do that. Uh, uh, Percy has her hand up. Sorry, was that? Percy has her hand up. Oh yes. Um, I wonder if the superintendent search committee could convene outside and discuss this just to see if they're to understand what all the alternatives are and uh, see if there's any other data that the um, group may want to have. Uh, Mr. Sickman, you're there. Oh, Ms. Ms. Seuss, did you have a comment on that? You're on mute. You're muted. No. Come on. Sorry, I, I keep reversing it. Um, so I'm comfortable having this discussion with the full group. I think it'd be great to get people's insight. I think the key issue is we only received two proposals. So the question is, um, would we get diff new and different and more proposals if we change the structure? Um, I think it'd be valuable to get the full committee's insight into this. Yeah, Len, I wanted to weigh in if I could. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with, I agree with, uh, I think it should be a topic of conversation for the full committee at the next meeting we have. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should be talking about it. I mean, we have two vendors. We should just all be talking about it, all seven of us. Okay, we can do that. Any other committee reports? Any liaison reports or announcements? I have an announcement. Go ahead. Uh, as a Vietnam vet, I would like to thank all the people of Arlington who stood out in the rain for a long time to honor Mary Foley yesterday. She was a Korean and Vietnam Air Force veteran and had no immediate family, but she had a phenomenal outturning of Arlington as her family. Thank you all. Thank you. Any Ms. Seuss, go ahead. Uh, so I just wanted to wish people Khagsamea, Happy Easter, um, Ramadan uh, Mubarak, <laughs> um, and just um, it's a difficult time, but I think some of these rituals, even if practiced um, in odd ways um, and not fully practiced, um, can give us comfort. Great. Are there any additional future agenda items? Besides the one we talked about. Okay. Uh, and then I, I wanted to, I put on here the date for the next um, school committee meeting because of April break, um, what used to be April break, uh, we had scheduled the meeting for the last week of April, which is three weeks from now. Um, I did not know if we wanted to go that long, uh, if we wanted to schedule it, move it back to the April break week since we're no longer taking the break, but we want to do a special meeting if the need comes up and leave it to me to call a special meeting. Uh, but I wanted to get the sense of the committee as to when we should next meet. Mr. Hayner, I'll go, I'll go through the list. Mr. Hayner? I would suggest we meet two weeks from tonight, uh, basically to discuss uh, the superintendent search. Uh, Dr. Allison Anthony? Um, I need uh, Mr. Thielman to weigh in on when our building committee meetings are. I can't remember if we have one scheduled for the 23rd or not. Yeah, now we have we have um, reserved the twenty. We're we're doing value engineering, potentially value, value engineering at sixty percent design phase of the project. So um, <clears throat> we have reserved the twenty first, the twenty second, and the twenty third. I am hoping we don't need the twenty third, but I don't know uh, for sure. I mean, we can go ahead and schedule it, and if there's <clears throat> two meetings going on at once, um, there's two meetings going on at once for part of the meeting. That's all we we'll have. To, I mean what'll happen. We have- um, Maybe you can do the school committee a little bit later. I don't know if that's an idea. There's several I'm sorry, Kathy. Several, yeah, well, I'll be, I'll be at the building and Michael Mason. Yeah. Mr. McCarthy. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe Len, go ahead and schedule it and then we can just, um, you know, as let me get, we get close. 
we can see. I don't know. But let's get a sense of the other committee members. Uh, Ms. Seuss, do you have a sense of when we should meet next? Do you have a sense of when we should meet next? Two weeks, three weeks? Um, no, I, I think I would leave it at the chair's discretion. A uh, lot's going to change in the next week, I assume, in terms of edicts from the state and other types of things. And so whatever seems to make sense. Uh, Mr. Thielman, any other thoughts? Maybe meet on the 16th. Maybe call, maybe, maybe, maybe everyone should just reserve the 16th. And then if we don't, if you say we don't need to have it, we don't have it. And then we meet the 16th and then we meet the uh, 30th. 16th. <clears throat> Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Schlickman. I, I think what we should do is uh, maintain the meeting of the 30th and maintain the possibility of a special meeting somewhere in between at the call of the chair. It doesn't necessarily have to be on a Thursday night, uh, but um, uh, if there's a necessary, if we need to come together, I think we should be able to pull it together as I don't think anybody's traveling. All right, Ms. Morgan. I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hainer, are you okay with that proposal? Sounds good. All right. I'm amiable, okay. old and amiable. All right, so we'll leave it at that. And uh, Jeff, if I do need to schedule a meeting, I will consult with you as to uh, when we could fit it in. Okay. All right, Is that looks like it. Motion to Motion. adjourn. So move. Need a second, second, folks. Second. All right. Second. 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 Uh, let's do the final roll call. Mr. Hayner. Yay. Dr. Allison Ampey. Aye. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Shookman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I'm yes as well. Be well and be right. safe. Thank you all, everyone.